to see you. Hey, everybody. How you guys you doing? We are live here. Uh, welcome to today's live stream. We have a very special guest with us today, Dr. Chafee. He's a well-known neurosurgeon and a fellow carnivore. So today we'll be diving deep into the topic of children of all ages following a carnivore diet. So Dr. Chafee, thank you for joining us. I appreciate it. Oh, you're, you're very welcome. I'm still just a, a neurosurgical oh, resident, though. I mean, I'm certainly not a famous neurosurgeon. Oh, okay. Uh, Sorry about that. Anyway. That's all right. Hey, I'm a, I, I'm a promoter, man. I, I'm a hype man. So maybe I yeah, have to a little okay. too much. But, <laughs> um, but before we get started with our topic, could you tell our audience a little bit about your background, you know, since you um, and clarify maybe what I did say and then how you got into carnivore? Yeah, well, so I'm an American medical doctor. I work currently in Australia. I'm in my neurosurgical residency, but I've, I've just had a, a special interest in diet and nutrition and how that help, affects health and chronic disease. Uh, well, for really for most of my life as an athlete, as a, as a biology student, and now as a doctor, and I, I found it's one of the most powerful tools in my life to be healthy and to reach peak optimal, peak athletic performance and health, but also it, more importantly in my family and my patients' lives. And this is one of the strongest tools that I've seen that uh, you know, can, can actually reverse quite a number of diseases and ailments that people never thought could be reversed. Well, simply because we didn't know what caused these things, so we were just treating the symptoms. And I think that we're now figuring out that it's actually the food that is causing the disease. And now you remove the sort of, sort of things that we eat, we remove that from our environment, you start eating a more biologically appropriate diet, something that humans are designed to eat, and that these, these problems go away. So that's what I've sort of been dedicating my my spare time too is just sort of getting that that message out there to people so that they can they can get better and feel good absolutely and we're glad you're doing that because you are a busy guy and it's a blessing to have you take whatever spare time you do have mm -hmm. and to give it to us um how did you find the carnivore diet quick how did you get into it so i i i, I came across well, I, I came to it basically not as the carnivore diet, not by that name, not by any other name. I wasn't doing a specific diet. I had just studied biology and botany and cancer biology and learned how toxic plants were, how this was their main defense in nature because they're stationary. They can't run away or fight back like animals can, but everything fights back. And so plants make about a million different defense chemicals. Many of those are, are toxic. Many of those are carcinogenic as per the WHO, as per every botany book on earth, as per my cancer biology professor. And he was just going through all the different carcinogens that were in plants naturally, talking about how toxic plants were by nature. And it was very, very mind blowing to us because this is the exact, no one had ever suggested this. Now there's, there's at least that conversation happening. At that time, there was no conversation happening. So this is the first time any of us had ever heard this. And so we were very taken aback by this. I remember thinking, I was like, well, but, but vegetables are still good for you though, right? And he, you know, he, he looked at us, he gave us a funny look and he just said, I don't eat salad. I don't eat vegetables. I don't let my kids eat vegetables. Plants are trying to kill you. And I was like, okay, screw plants. And I'm just not going to eat these things anymore. So I wasn't doing carnivore. I, I didn't think about it as I should have, which was, hey, you know, humans have been apex predators and carnivores for millions of years, this is kind of what I'm doing. You know, I'm going back before the agricultural revolution. Um, but I didn't, I just went, okay, I'm, I'm just never eating a plant. And so I just defaulted into eating meat and eggs. And I, it, it was a massive, massive improvement in my health and certainly in my athletic performance. That was night and day difference. And so I did that for a number of years, but because I wasn't you know, doing a diet and I wasn't doing something that was biologically appropriate and thinking about things in, in ancestral terms and biological terms. It, eventually I sort of slipped off of it, you know, just from situation when I was in England playing rugby over there, I didn't have the same access to food that I did in America. Some of the meat was breaded and I just sort of got it out of convenience and thought to myself, as, as the argument goes now, well, but do, you know, poison is dose dependent. And so I said that to myself, well, you know, Poison depends on the dose, so maybe a little bit of this won't really hurt. It did though. That 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 yeah, dose makes a poison. That dose is really damn small, you know. So I mean, think about it this way: you have four grams of glucose running through your body at any given time. That's a level teaspoon of glucose, right? Mm -hmm. Even just one gram 
more glucose in your body, more blood sugar. That is a toxic dose. And your body responds to it as a toxic dose by trying to detoxify, by raising your insulin to bring that below four grams. And it causes huge disruption to your body. If, it, if you maintain it above four grams, this is, this is where you start seeing the complications of diabetes, of uncontrolled diabetes, like leg amputations, kidney failure, heart failure, and all sorts of other sorts of ailments. So it's a fine line. It's a very fine line. Our bodies need to be fueled in, in very precise ways. It can handle other ways, but the wheels start to fall off eventually. And so if you want your, your wheels to stay on, uh, you know, you should, you should think about what actually goes in your body. And so, yeah, that's how I did that. But you know, I slipped off of it. And then six years ago now, I came across Sean Baker on Joe Rogan's podcast. My brother saw it. He said, Hey, there's this doctor. He used to play rugby and he's saying, you can get all your nutrition from meat. And it, instantly my first response was like, well, that's crazy. You can't. And then I was like, hold on a second. I did that for like five years. And, and that was a period of, of my life that I've never felt better in my life. And so I was like, okay. And I remember thinking about it at the time. I was just like, I was like, am I missing some vitamins? Do I need to eat a banana or something? <laughs> and I remember thinking, I was like, well, you know, I feel good. And my gums aren't bleeding. So let's just ride this out, see what happens. And it was five years. There's no, no issues. The exact opposite, in fact. And so I took a look at it, and within five minutes, I, I realized that I was just like, "No, this, this is, this is, this is really." He's really onto something, and there was more to the story than that because I, obviously, I had the sort of the plant background, my own experience with it, um, but also you know the data on fructose that started coming out showing that this was very problematic to people's health, and and that fat and cholesterol and LDL were probably not what they were cracked up to be, and and so at that point, I. I sort of said to myself, right, I knew it. I knew plants were trying to kill me, get rid of these stupid things. And it just completely revitalized my health. I was 38 years old at the time. And then within two weeks, I felt like I was 22 again. And I'd lost you know, 23 pounds in two weeks. And I just felt amazing. Just all this inflammation just shed off my body. And I, I went back and started playing rugby again because it felt good. And uh, and I wanted to. So it was uh, at that point I started really digging into the research and really thinking about it. I'm like, hold on a second. Humans actually are carnivores. That is the kind of animal that we are. And that's what I was doing. I was living as a carnivore. I was living to our biological design. This makes sense now. And I started looking at this from a, from a medical point of view. And he, humans are carnivores and we're not eating as such. We're eating outside of that. And just any car, any zoo with the signs that say don't feed the animals it makes them very sick to not eat their natural diet i, I applied that to us i was like okay this makes sense now all everything just started slotting into place and so that's when i started really digging into the literature i was you know i had a, had some spare time with them at, at that time because i was helping with a family emergency i was just back from doing um humanitarian work in bangladesh and so i had time and i just spent like 10 12 hours well, eight to ten hours a day just digging into the literature and just asking questions and seeing, you know, what answers we had. And, and here we are. Now I'm trying to share that with others. And yeah, that's, that's an awesome, and I'm glad you're here. So thank you for accepting the invitation. So let's yeah, dive sure. right into the topic. Kids aren't carnivore. Just flat out. Do you think we should put any kids on, on the carnivore diet, doctor? I, I think that we should put every kid on the carnivore diet. And I mean, think about it just from, again, a natural point of view, every single mammal on earth drinks their mother's milk and then gets weaned onto the mother's diet and then eats that diet the rest of their life and teaches their kids how to eat that diet. It is, it is uniform across, uh, you know, across the board. And that's certainly the case for us. And you look at indigenous populations, it's it, that holds to that exact model as well. So this is what we're designed to eat. This is how we get the best nutrition and it's and, and proper nutrition is most important when kids are developing. That's when their brains are developing, the bodies are developing. If you look pre and post agriculture, there's a, there's a clear demarcation in, in the fossil record. It's not hundreds of years or thousands of years. It's overnight. Everywhere in the world that has switched to agriculture, regardless of the location, regardless of the time period, regardless of the crop, a similar pattern occurs. The height and health of these people decline. The dental health, oral health, the jaws, the teeth, they all started declining. The height decline, the uh, femoral length decline. They had signs of poor wound healing, signs of infectious disease. And the brains shrank by 11% for adult males, by 17% for adult females. That's persisted until today. 
that is developmental. That is not genetic. That is not evolutionary. That is not normal. That is not supposed to happen. So if you want your child to develop properly, if you want their brains to develop properly, their nervous system to develop properly, to grow to the height that they're de designed to grow to, not anything abnormal. You're not, you know, it's not like this, like Chinese, you know, Yao Ming experiment where they're just pumping in growth hormone into people or something like that. You know, it's, this is just, just having them de develop to their genetic potential. You know, this isn't, we're not doing a Gattaca or something like that, where we're just like you know, freaky playing with people's genetics. This is, this is how they're supposed to develop. And so if you want your kids to develop to that point, and it's not a small difference. It's not a subtle difference. It's a massive difference. And I've seen women breastfeeding who have switched to a carnivore diet while breastfeeding and the kids development just takes off. I mean, it really just, it, you know, it, it's going at a good pace. That's normal. Everything's great. And all of a sudden, wham. It just spikes up. And, you know, one lady uh, that I went to, um, well, that I knew when I was in medical school and uh, we were friends then, she went went carnivore sort of when she was uh, pregnant with her with her first child. And it completely cleared up her morning sickness. She had hyperemesis, she had projectile vomiting every single day for 32 weeks. And I think that's a protective measure. Your body's saying, hey, there's stuff in here that's not, it's not good for the baby. Get this stuff out. And it's the most important time to be on a proper diet is when you're you're pregnant, obviously. That fetus is in ketosis. Breastfeeding babies are in ketosis. That's because they need to be for their brain to grow properly because you need ketones to grow your brain. And um, and so she switched over. Hyperemesis stopped. She had a completely normal pregnancy after that. The kid's developing great, but she's still eating some grains and oats because her mom said that that was a good thing for her milk. After about three months, she decided, well, you know what? I'm just going to go full bore on this. She stopped. At three months old, her baby was 50th percentile in height, length, and weight. In one month, she went to 99th percentile in head circumference and length. So really advancing to the point that her pediatric uh, nurse looked at this as she's got hydrocephalus. She's going to have to go to a neurosurgeon. Oh, my God, she's going to die. And she was perfect. She was fine. She, I mean, you know, when you have hydrocephalus, that's pressure on the brain, and it's, and it's very serious. You get very, you, know, you can really damage damage the brain. And this child gets very lethargic and sleepy. They go into comas and they die. Mm -hmm. And so, turns out, of course, she did not have hydrocephalus. She had she just her brain was just developing and growing, and she was you know doing very very well. And so, all her subsequent kids are just literally off the charts, you know, with their development. So yeah, it's, it is the most important time to develop. I'll, I'll do you one, one more. There's a, there's a, uh, a disease in cows that is exactly the same as, as muscular dystrophy in humans. It's called muscular dystrophy, but it's called nutritional muscular dystrophy in cows. And that's because they figured out it's actually from a selenium deficiency. And so in the genetically susceptible cows, that have that aren't getting enough selenium they develop muscular dystrophy and so what you do is just give them salt lick sort of mineral lick with with selenium in it sorts it right out well that begs the question is our muscular dystrophy uh selenium or some sort of other nutritional deficiency and how many other childhood maladies are nutritional deficiencies Diet is is strongly related and tied up to autism. And in fact, the University of Texas A&M showed that a carnitine deficiency, which we're told is a, is a non-essential amino acid, but it is not non-essential for, for everybody. Only 70% of people make enough of it. So, and you can only get it from meat and you really lar mostly get it from red meat. And so vegans and vegetarians who don't meet, eat much or any animal products and certainly no red meat, they, they can be very deficient in this. And so if their children don't make enough carnitine, they can develop you know, autism because of that, because the brain needs carnitine, it needs choline, it needs all these sorts of things, and your brain does not develop properly. So yes, uh, long-winded answer, but yes, I think that it's the most important time uh, to feed kids uh, a proper diet, and that diet for us is, is meat. You know, and I'll ask one more question, and we'll pass it off to Courtney next. Um, you just mentioned autism. Do, do you think a child on autism would improve on the carnivore diet in any sort of way? I, I do. I do think so. And I, and there's evidence for that. There's there's published literature on that. Um, there's a paper that that's that actually argued for the ketogenic diets in general as a treatment modality for autism. There are 
there are groups that treat autism that specifically use ketogenic diets like you know, carnivore diet is a ketogenic diet. And this just helps the brain develop. Uh, Professor Chris Palmer from Harvard thinks the same. He wrote about this in his book, Brain Energy. And he thinks that a lot of mental health issues like schizophrenia, but also autism are from a misdevelopment or from a malfunction of the, of the mitochondria when you're developing the mitochondria are obviously even more important because they, they help with the development. The, the mitochondria don't just make energy. They, they sort of run the ship. They're like sailors on a ship going up and down the mast and rigging and all these sorts of things. They move around and use utensils or like a, a factory worker. They move around between machines and use the machines, right? So they're, they're making energy, but they're not just putting it out into space. They are physically moving to this organelle, pumping out a bunch of ATP so that that can do its job. And so they're running the entire program they're, they're actually moving these machines um in inside the cell so they're they're really really important and when you get dysfunction it's just not going to work properly and when you get dysfunction and it's not working properly when you're developing it, it causes huge lasting ramifications like autism and so there are already papers there are already publications saying that hey look this is this is a a viable treatment modality for autism. And I've, I've certainly seen that in, in practice with different people uh, and their families and their children and, and their personal experiences. Adults with autism, um, you know, uh, have, have, have found, you know, Jonathan Griffiths, who's a, a British bodybuilder, where we did a, pod, a couple of podcasts together, very nice guy. And he said that, and this sort of came up and he mentioned that he actually has autism. I would have never guessed that. And he said that a, a year ago, before he started uh, carnivore, he would not have been able to have the conversation we were having right then. You know, so yes, it can absolutely help. Obviously, you know, if you catch it early enough, that's going to be better. You know, the, the child's brain is going to develop better. But even as an adult, it helps it function better. So there's some sort of issue with your brain running on glucose that's not really helpful for it. Obviously, it slows down the mitochondria. Your insulin is uh, raised, and so it doesn't let your cells turn over, doesn't let your mitochondria turn over. So just being in ketosis after a few months, you have four times the number of mitochondria, and they're four times as effective. That's what the literature shows. And so this goes for your brain as well. And so when you're developing, obviously, that makes a much greater impact. And, and you can, you can turn a lot of things around, uh, just getting enough carnitine, you know, if that's the type, if that's why you're developing autism or that specific type of autism that derives from a carnitine deficiency, that, that obviously you can start correcting the ship and you can start, then you have enough carnitine, you're going to, and that actually is integral in mitochondrial health as well. And so you have enough carnitine, your mitochondria are working better, you're on a ketogenic diet, your mitochondria are really working better, your brain starts developing better, your neurons start de developing better, and you can actually uh, reverse a lot of the symptoms of autism. Uh, and that's, seen, well, that's in the literature, and that's what, what people are experiencing. It's not necessarily going to do that for everyone, but I have yet to see someone who it didn't. Wow. Love it. Love it, doctor. I want to introduce you to Courtney, the holistic carnivore. How are you doing, Courtney? I'm doing well. How are you? <laughs> We're doing great. Uh, great. You got a question for the doc? I do. So Dr. Chafee, I'm actually an integrative and functional nutrition PhD candidate studying the um, the carnivore diets effects on HbA1c. Um, nice. So I have some pretty heavy questions. Um, mm -hmm. My first question, you're talking about the role of, you know, diet with autism. And it makes me think about the current Western diet and how it's so laden with gluten, not just from flour and bread sources, right? Mm -hmm. And we know that the mechanism of gluten has some interaction with dop dopamine receptors in the brain. And so I know that some parents might have a concern when they're bringing their children off of carbohydrates about the potential of some like misbehavior and struggles with like mood swings. Can you expand a bit on how to maybe mitigate these challenges if a parent were to go, you know what, that's it, plants are out, right? Mm -hmm. And say, okay, now we're on to meat. How do you think they should handle that? Well, you know, look, that's a very good question. And it's, it's especially with, depending on the child's age, you know, especially if they're carbohydrate addicted, sugar addicted, it's, it's, it can be very difficult, you know, and if they're teenagers, obviously they're going to, they're by definition going to be more rebellious and they're going to be able to go to school. They're going to go out with their friends. They're going to, they're just going to buy whatever the hell they want. Um, but, you know, depending on your relationship with your kids, you can, 
you can obviously talk to them, educate them, and say, hey, look, this is this is a really important thing. It's obviously always the best thing to do. If they're young enough, you, you just you can obviously start. I mean, you you control what goes in that house at that point, and you can just sort of stop buying these certain things, or maybe just start buying less and less and sort of weaning them off. And there's just a little less and a little less. And like, oh, where's that that treat or that that snack? It was just like, oh, we don't we don't have that right now. You know, can I make you some eggs or something like that? And you just sort of you know, work them into that, um, that realm, you know, doing, doing a hard stop can be hard for a lot of people. And, and especially for kids that aren't used to that, don't understand why that's going on. So you, it doesn't have to be an overnight thing necessarily unless someone is, is very unwell. Uh, but, uh, and, you know, especially for, for kids with autism that they can be very tactile and maybe like just don't like certain things because it, it, it feels funny to them. They don't like how it feels in their mouth. They don't like eating it. And so, but there, there generally is something that they will eat from the animal kingdom and you can just sort of try to introduce those and, and make those much more available and just sort of start weaning things off. And um, the teenagers are dif difficult. I think you, you just need to sort of reason with them and just talk to them more about, hey, look, this is, this is what I'm doing and this is a lot better and this is why and, and talk about the benefits of it. And then you just sort of have a bit less and a bit less and a bit less in the house. And so it's like, listen, you know, if you want that stuff, you know, you can, but I really don't want this in the house and, and, uh, try that way. Or, Hey, you know, would you be willing to do this with me for 30 days to help me do this and all that sort of stuff. And so uh, quite often, you know, if you have, depending on your relationship with your kids, you know, they'll be interested in doing what you're doing. And, you know, if, if you're, you know, I mean, that's, that's how kids learn, you know, that's all, all mammals study their parents to see how, how do I survive? How do I make it? You know, so those are some of the things, but it's, um, it can be difficult you know, when you're transitioning off carbohydrates and sugar, it, they're, they're drugs and they have effects on your brain and your dopamine, as you said. And so it, it, there can be a, a lag period before you start feeling your best. And you may even feel, uh, pretty wretched, you know, going through withdrawals. Hopefully it's not that severe. Hopefully people start feeling better straight away. And, and maybe you early on the kids, if they have a, a special, meat or whatever that they're really fond of you just go for for that so you get all their favorite sort of meals and it's like wow this is fun this is great i like this you know i'm eating like a king here um and then it's it's not as hard of a transition then after a couple of weeks they're going to feel amazing and then they sort of slip off of that and you know they, they don't feel as good and they sort of point out well okay well what what did you eat well i actually had this thing and now my back sore and my knees are aching and like you know and i have my my muscles soreness after i worked out and i wasn't sore before that and you just start pointing out that, yeah, that's because of the things you're eating. And then and it just sort of self reinforces after that for most of them. But yeah, it's difficult. Some, some people, some people are just going to be a tough case. Absolutely. Um, I just want to, we'll, we'll work our way around here. Nia, um, from Nia's way, that's her YouTube channel. Do you have a question for Dr. Chafee? Mom, I do, but I also have my little one right here who's been talking. To me. <laughs> so if I, are you good, baby? I'm so sorry. No, you're all good. It's fine. Um, I do. I do have a question. Um, I actually was. Thank you, by the way, for for doing this with us. I'm excited to meet you and and thankful that you're answering all the questions because it's kind of a little scary sometimes to be in this way of eating and and then trying to do the right thing by our kids and wanting to make sure that that that's the case, especially like when you go to the pediatrician, like I did earlier this week, um, just for a wellness exam with my three and almost four year old daughter. Um, mm -hmm. and she was kind of just going through the motions and didn't stop to really pry into what I mentioned about diet, but she pointed something out to me and I thought it would be, you know, something I would like to ask about milk consumption. So, um, I was fortunate enough to be able to breastfeed my baby for about two years, but then I switched to whole milk after that. And she's slightly lactose intolerant. Um, my fiance, her, her dad is completely lactose intolerant. And so we just kind of assumed that that's where that came from. So we give her lactose free whole milk and she still drinks a lot of milk. She probably drinks maybe five to six cups a day. And so I was telling the pediatrician that, and she said that toddlers should really be limited to about 24 ounces of milk per day. She said drinking whole milk was good, which I was happy to hear. But um, mm -hmm. she said that due to like, if she, if she wasn't drinking any more iron fortified formula, that that, you know, if I had switched her from formula to milk, which we didn't talk about the fact that I had breastfed her, but um, 
that it, since she wasn't getting that supplemented iron through the formula, that there was a potential for the milk to actually reduce her iron absorption from the food that she's eating. And that's why she recommended to limit it. And so I was curious, I did a little bit of reading and I saw, you know, some opinions saying that, well, that might be the case if they're not consuming enough red meat or, you know, other iron sources in their diet, which she does. So, you know, outside of getting her iron levels tested, do you think there's any issue with limiting the milk that, you know, toddler age kids drink or young children drink? So I think, I think that obviously if you're going to, if you're going to have milk, you do, do whole, whole milk. The kids are much, I think, I think, I think about it from, from a different point of view. I don't think it's necessarily going to cause an iron deficiency. Um, but obviously, you know, that's easy, easy to check, but I think, Younger kids, especially infants, can't do well on, on cow's milk because it has a lot more casein than than our milk does, or breast milk does, and, and, and it's not good for their development. They can't really, uh, well, they really don't can't necessarily survive on on cow's milk, and that's why historically they would use goat's milk if they're they haven't had a surrogate if they couldn't get like a wet nurse or something like that, and the mom couldn't breastfeed for whatever reason, but. Um, the, I think of it more from a, from a term of ketosis. Like I was saying, your brain needs to be, your body needs to be in ketosis for your brain to properly develop. And when, when kids are young, then it's, it's a lot easier for them to be in ketosis. But if you get enough sugar, you will force them out of that. And as they get older, it's, it's a bit more difficult. And then when we're adults, we really just have to avoid carbs for days and then we get back into it. And so, you know, for, for her brain development, optimal brain development, I would probably limit it just because of the carbohydrates and just trying to keep her in ketosis because the, the ketones cross the blood brain barrier and reconstitute into fatty acids. And that, you, and those are used as the physical building blocks and material of the brain. And so if you don't have an abundant supply of ketones, if you're not in ketosis pretty much all the time, then you're, you're, you are going to limit the amount of, of available material to grow her brain and nervous system. So that would be my main concern. I don't think it's, I don't think it's necessarily bad, like it's going to harm her. It's just going to not be as optimal as other things and, and might limit her uh, development in that sense. Um, certainly at some point, if she has enough carbs or even now, I mean, this is the problem too. People go to formula, there's tons of sugar or other sorts of you know, baby food, kids food, tons of sugar, and it's kicking them out of ketosis. It's keeping them from having that proper brain development. And so we didn't get our proper brain development for the last 10,000 years because, you know, we, we've curtailed that. Um, you know, if she is eating a lot of meat and red meat, she's going to get a lot of heme iron. A lot of those things are looking at people eating a standard diet. So if, okay. Um, you know, if, if a normal kid eating a normal diet were to, eat, to drink that much milk, could that limit the iron? I mean, that, that's where your pediatrician is coming from because that's all the data we have. Never really looked at this from kids that are eating, drinking milk and red meat and like, that's it, you know, or, or a, a lot of red meat. So I don't, I don't, I wouldn't think that would be much of a problem, although I'm not a pediatrician and I don't, I don't uh, know for sure, but I would, I would expect that she would be fine on that. If you are concerned, I would get a blood test, but I, I would, probably limit milk actually for, for other reasons as well. I think that it's, it is important. It's most important, uh, for kids to be in ketosis and to have, to have enough abundance of ketones available for their brain to develop. And, um, and I would just, you know, like I said, you know, mammals drink mother's milk and then they wean onto the, what the adults are eating and then they just eat that. And, you know, although milk is very nutritious in a lot of ways, especially raw milk, it is not the same as meat. It's not the same thing as meat. And that's, so that's, that's our, that's our optimal food. And so I think it, it would be better to just eat meat at that, at that stage, but I don't think it's horrible. I think there's a lot of really good things in it. And it's certainly better than any of the bloody formula, you know, iron supplemented or not. I mean, it's like the, you know, American formula is like required to have seed oils in it because it's supposed to, have, it has to have a certain amount of polyunsaturated fats to be, you know, healthy and um that's not healthy those aren't healthy polyunsaturated fats and so that's um that's something that's required so you're going to have to get a bunch of seed oil seed oils and omega-6 especially linoleic acid that is not a building block material people say it's a, it's a uh, an essential fatty acid but i was i was actually just speaking to um harvard uh psychiatrist named georgia e just wrote a book called you know, change your diet change your mind and she talks about how important it is to be on 
proper diet and, and even carnivore diet to fix mental health issues. And she was saying that she, she didn't think that omega-6 was, was essential at all. In fact, it's only essential if, if it, to make arachidonic acid and they're like, well, you need it because you need arachidonic acid. It's like you get arachidonic acid if you eat red meat, right? So if you eat meat, you're already going to get that. So you actually don't need omega-6s. There are omega-6s in meat and, and pretty much everything anyway. So you'll get a bit anyway. You don't need to go after it. But if you get an abundance of this, this actually goes into the brain. This is not used as a building block material. Omega-3 fatty acids like DHA and EPA are. ALA, which is in plants, is not. That does not go well for your brain. Um, but the omega-6s can go into the brain. And because they're not used as structural components, they actually are burned for energy. And that's a bad thing because you know, your brain's supposed to be running on ketones, these shorter uh, sort of fatty acid derivatives. And the omega-6 is very long, very unstable, polyunsaturated uh, omega-6 fatty acid. And this breaks down, it gives a lot of oxidative stress and a lot, a lot of free radicals and can actually damage your brain because it's running on this, this pretty poor fuel. And so you really want, especially in a developing brain, but any brain, you don't want to, you don't want to have an abundance of linoleic acid omega-6s. And so I, yeah, I would, I would definitely avoid formulas as well. So this is definitely better than 99.99% of, of what other parents are feeding their kids. So, you know, already that's amazing. You're already doing a lot of great things for your kids. I think that, you know, if we're thinking about milk, I think the reason to stop milk would be just, you know, for those other reasons described. And also it doesn't have all the nutrients you need. Meat has all the nutrients she needs. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's not deficient in any respect in that as long as you're getting you know good quality meat with a lot of fat so i think that that it can be improved but you're already doing better than almost everybody so so well done great question nia and great response dr chaffee uh jeff you're up next buddy can you hear me jeff i know you met jeff before <laughs> doctor yeah yeah how hey, you doing dr. Man? good how are you yeah good thank you you got a question jeff for dr chaffee well um not really, but I do want to just, to anybody watching this, I want to explain that, especially because I work with teenagers, not only as a high school phys ed teacher, but I have two teenage sons, 15 and 13. And my sons and myself have been watching Dr. Anthony Shafee for about 20, probably 22 months. And you are our Superman. You are our Michael <laughs> Jordan. You are just, just everything about uh, you we admire and I want to thank you so much for being here because I hope that some of the teenagers I work with see this video because myself and my good friend Dwight that I, I coach a lot of sports with, um, we're constantly working with teenage athletes and we're telling them the success that we're having uh, as, uh, as adults and especially me, everybody knows I, I'm, uh, I'm dealing with uh, stage four cancer and I'm thriving. My energy's through the roof. Uh, and speaking of Dr. Anthony Shafee, you spoke about um, you can role model for your kids and it's very easy to, to influence your kids on what to eat. And basically the households that, you know, the kids are eating too much sugar and too much this, too much carbs. It's, it's, it's not the kid's fault. It's the, it's the, it's the parents. Every, everything is always the parent's fault. And, you know, I, I know it's a very hard topic because these athletes that we work with, Dr. Shafee, they get really intrigued and then they start asking questions and some of them, they want to try it. Some of them go home and tell their parents, uh, the stuff that we're talking about. And then the next thing, you know, uh, the principal of my high school is like, ah, you can't talk about the carnivore diet. Ah, you got to talk to the Canada's food guide or us food guide or whatever. Right. And mm. you know what? it's kind of it's disappointing um how we have to shelter it and hide it so I, my question to you is i think i know the answer but i want to hear what you say professionally in terms of how you think we can get the word out to kids to teenagers on how to be optimal how to be great athletes and use food for fuel uh on, on the sport field well 
you know, I, I, I mean, I think it's, I think it's a bit ridiculous that you, you're not allowed to give a nutritional advice. You're a physical education teacher. This is part of physical education. You know, being a coach, you know, I certainly was given nutritional advice from, from my coaches at that time. It was all low fat, all that sort of crap. Um, and so, you know, but we were given advice, right. And just because that, that advice, you know, uh, went along certain guidelines and principles doesn't mean that they weren't giving advice, right. They, they, you are allowed to do that. And so, you know, one of, one of the things too, is that, is that you can, you can go to the parents first and say, Hey, listen, this is, this is the program. Like if you were coaching a team, Hey, this is something that we've had really good success with in on a special diet is really good for performance. And you talk about it that way. And we have doctors and things like that involved. It's not going to hurt them. It's not going to cause ill health and we're not, we're not doing anything unsafe for them. You know, you guys can elect to do this or not, but this is, this is what we recommend for our athletes. And our athletes that do this have better performance and better health. And you can just do it that way. And then the parents start going, oh, okay, all right, interesting. We'll think about it. Maybe they choose no, but at least it's out there. It's in the open and they don't feel like their kids are being unduly influenced, you know, sort of, uh, you know, behind their back. Um, also, you can just you can just say, well, look, this is, this is what I do. This is what I've had uh, good success with. You guys can do what you want. You can look it up. There's a lot of people on YouTube and, and do what you want, you know, and then, and then that sort of protects you. You know, you, you're suggesting it out there. Your people know about it and they can do their own research. They can look into it themselves and they can say, well, I'm going to do this. Um, but if, if, um, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult when you're in, in a situation like that, you know, because if, if you get a bunch of pissed off parents, um, you know, that can, that can impact, you know, your work. I mean, I have to, I have to tread lightly in certain aspects of my, of my career because, you know, until I'm, you know, done with, with everything nursing and these are my patients and my practice. Uh, I have to be careful on that, but I still, when someone has a serious issue, like they have cancer or something like that, I don't think it's ethical to withhold that information. And so even though it's, you know, it, the, the hospital doesn't necessarily want me talking about this with patients. I still feel that in certain circumstances, I can't get around this. And I just say, Oh, this is just me. This is not the hospital. This is not the department. I'm coming to you on my own time, but this is something that I've found. Here's some literature. You take a look at this yourself because I don't think that it's ethical to withhold that and just be like, well, I know that this has worked and helped people survive their cancer and, and uh, better and treat their cancer better and, and, and help their life. And I know that, and that's in the literature. This is evidence-based medicine. So I can't, I don't think that it's, it's, that I'm morally able to not tell them, you know, and it, and for me, I, I, you know, it, I'm, I'm practicing evidence-based medicine. This is in the literature. There are clinical trials showing that this works in this situation. And so just because the hospital doesn't fucking get that yet, that's really not my problem. And I'm not going to make it my patient's problem. It's nicer in, in, in my private practice because I can say whatever the hell I want, you know, because they're coming to see me privately, but you know, you do have to sort of, you know, play the game a little bit. So there, there are ways to do that. You know, you just say, "Hey, look, this is what I'm doing." Uh, the kids already know about it now, right? It's gonna, it's gonna get people interested. People are gonna start asking you questions. Like, well, look, this is what I do, and this is why I do it. And here's some you can, you can check these things out if you want to. You know, I, mean, I can't tell you, you know, one way or the other. Blah blah blah. Or you can, you know, do the, the whole thing with like coaching. Hey, this is, this is what we're gonna try to do as a team. This seems to work. Try to get the parents on board. And, and make it a more open and public sort of thing. Because, you know, the first time everyone here probably heard about this, they just went, excuse me, you know, is that really what you're doing? And so, you know, we have to remember that, that parents of these kids are going to be doing the same thing. And so they'll meet only, hold on, that causes cancer and heart disease and all that's killing the environment. And oh my God, and all the Loraxes are gone now. And so it's like, you know, it's, they're, they're going to freak out, you know, unless it, it's sort of, you know, prefaced in, in the right way. So you could, you could try that well as well and hopefully get, get more and more traction. No, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Anthony Shafee. Um, and I, and you're right. Just being proactive. I've always been as a teacher having parent meetings and stuff like that at the beginning to lay it all out. But with me being off work, it's a little more difficult. I just show mm. up to coach the teams. Um, and it's the only other thing I just want to add in. It's a little frustrating because I've taught nutrition for 21 years. I'm a little bit embarrassed of what I've taught, but my son, Peter, who's in grade 10 at my high school, you know, he had nutrition taught in health this year and his phys ed teacher who's there teaching for me because I'm off, 
she's a, she's a vegetarian and she can tell her story. <laughs> he, she could tell her story about being a vegetarian and nobody mm. complains. But then, you know, the carnivore, people are all up in arms. Uh, not everybody, just there's always just a few that are up in arms about it. Most of them are pretty intrigued by they see what I'm doing because I was supposed to be dead two, two years ago. So they see what yeah. I'm doing and they're pretty intrigued. And you're absolutely right. The, the, especially the boys, the boys really act, they ask the questions because they're into building muscle and getting stronger and faster. So are girls too, but the boys, they really get intrigued by, uh, by whatever superpower you can offer them. <laughs> Well, it's a it's a little bullshit that you know no one's no one's uh, you know pushing back against the vegetarian garbage, you know, because like that that's a nutritionally deficient diet, yes. and um, you know, like Italy is just like has some laws like you're not allowed to like you know push a vegetarian vegan diet for kids because it's just it's just it's it's a it's a it, it's not even an inferior diet; it's just an insufficient diet for kids. You do, do not get all the nutritional wow. materials you know, for, for child development. So, you know, if, if your principal is letting her get away with that shit, you know, I, I'd push back on that. Just be like, listen, you know, she's pushing this shit, you Absolutely. know, and that's like that's nutritionally deficient. You can't even get B12 from that crap. You know, what, what the hell is that supposed to do? You, you get brain damage if your B12 goes too low, you know, and there's a, there's a, there was a, uh, a study out of Oxford in 2008 that showed that vegans, after five years, their brains shrank by over 5%. And I see this in neurosurgery all the time. I've spoken to other neurosurgical colleagues about this. You see the atrophy of the spinal cord, it thins out because they're not getting the, the building material for their nervous system and their nerves. And part of that is B12. Because B12 is, is integral for, for myelinating the axons, which are your nerve fibers that come down. And without proper myelination, you don't get proper conductivity. You don't get, your brain doesn't work properly. Your body doesn't work properly. And you can get neurological dysfunction. You can get nerve damage. You can get brain damage, especially developmental uh, damage as well. And the, the Oxford authors of that paper thought that it was uh, the, the grossly insufficient amount of B12 that these people had. And that B12 level is in is within the normal limits for B12 in America, Australia, and Europe. And they thought, found that was grossly insufficient. It's within the normal damn range. So, you know, this is just, this is not acceptable. And so it, you should just, you know, it'd be nice. And, you know, I'm sure your friends with the principal just be like, hey, you know, Miss May is, uh, is pushing this shit. Why can't I? You know, why can't I give the counterpoint? I teach nutrition. I've been teaching this for 22 years. That's my class. Why am I not allowed to do that? You know, why am I not allowed to, to, to advise my kids and my, you know, that I'm, that, that are playing on my teams, you know, what to do? I mean, this, this is, this is a performance based, you know, endeavor. Like we, we, you need your body to work properly. Of course, nutrition is part of that. I teach nutrition, you know, this is my job to give proper nutritional advice. And you don't need to say carnivore diet. You're saying, hey, guys, we're going to do a biologically appropriate diet. We're going to eat what humans have been designed to eat. This is the best nutrition for humans. And so, you know, this is like, look back. What are people eating during the ice ages? You know, there's, um, there are uh, footprints and fossilized footprints in, uh, over in Eastern Australia. And, you know, the early aboriginals, this is like, you know, 20, 30,000 years old. They're in clay. They were running in wet clay right? Presumably after some animal, right? And the stride length, they had three people running and they, and they estimated that one of these guys was running faster than Hussein Bolt over like a half mile stretch on wet freaking clay, right? You know, this is just, people were just badasses, you know? And when you, when you eat what you're supposed to eat your body's going to work in in magically different ways as everyone here can attest to and this is most important again for kids development and athleticism so you know if you guys want it you know so if, if you want you know these kids to be the best and all these sorts of things you mean you know like why wouldn't i why wouldn't you want me to suggest this sort of shit you know they're saying oh just eat a bunch of plants and all that sort of stuff and that's fine why is that get a pass you know, I'm talking about something that we've been eating for 2 million years. Where's the harm there? When heart disease showed up in 1912, right? So what's the problem? We were eating meat before that. We didn't just start eating meat. What we started eating a lot more of was plants and processed crap. So, you know, I don't know. I think, I, I think I'd, I'd cause a bit of a ruckus in that situation. <laughs> <laughs>
Thanks. Thanks for having my back there. <laughs> no worries, man. Love it, Jeff. Great question. Uh, Ellie, you're up next. Nourishment Redacted is her YouTube channel. How are you doing, Ellie? Um, I'm so thankful to be here tonight. Um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Shafee. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. You were one of the first doctors that I found about the carnivore diet. It's changed my life. And I don't oh, want my cool. children to suffer from obesity, mental health issues, and rosacea, and so many more horrible things when I was like on the standard American diet. And um, I never want my children to be as sick as I was. And so I actually um, i am so passionate about this. I have a little series on my channel called Mother Knows Best, Meat Based mm -hmm. Kids, where I invite mothers and experts to talk about this topic. And um, you know, I used to be a parent that was so confused about how to feed children. Um, and now my 18 month old who started carnivore at six months old and my daughter who's three and a half, she started uh, about uh, like five months ago. I see the difference in them. Like they are amazing, beautiful children. And, um, but then there's something that like weighs heavy on my heart. It's like children naturally develop an interest in building different skills as they age. And we as parents, we want to like, we want to foster that passion, no matter her, like how simple or complex. But, you know, my carnivore daughter, she has so she had an interest in baking bread and cake. And I know she's young, but it's like, I see sugar as absolutely horrible for people. And I'm so disgusted by like sugary desserts and most baked goods. But, you know, I understand it's not the best nutritionally for her, but like she wants to learn the skill of baking bread. She wants to learn uh, like how to make cakes and i know she's young but she's like you know she's very intelligent i'd say she's like mentally like more like a five-year-old like with the way she speaks which is a blessing but obviously i want her to eat whole like whole foods as much as possible meat based whole foods maybe a few berries every once in a while but like should i discourage her like i know she's only three to have but it's just like i don't want to squash like you know her interest and in, like wanting to be to gain these skills and there's other things that kids might come up and say oh i want to do this but i was just curious about what you thought about that yeah well it, it it's difficult isn't it i mean you do want to try to help encourage things and if they find they have an interest in something then, then that's great i mean you certainly don't want them eating it afterwards and so i you, you know, talk to them it's like well you know we can we can make this we can learn at it but like i don't think it's really good to eat it but it might be fun to do and maybe we can do that and if if she's happy with that then then great you know um and it might be that you can say oh actually there's this other thing too when you start you know, shifting her over to cooking more carnivore sort of stuff and say, Hey, this is fun too. Look, we can do this recipe. We can make waffles out of, you know, cheese and eggs and all that sort of stuff. And like, look, and it comes out just like a waffle. Isn't that great? And it tastes better and it's good for you too. And all that sort of stuff. Um, and you know, that, I mean, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult. I mean, it's, um, I, I want to use an extreme example here, but I, I don't know. I mean, it's just like if you, you know, if, if she was saying, it's just like, mom, I don't want to smoke crack, but I really want to learn how to make a crack pipe. It's like, no, <laughs> what are you talking about? You know, we're not, we're oh not going to do that. That's ridiculous. Obviously it's not the same thing, but it's sort of thing about that. It's just like, it's like, well, do you need these skills? It's not something that's going to benefit you, you know, in, in, in your life and in your health, you know, having those skills is maybe something you know, down the road that, that might be fun to do, but you know, is that, is that, is that something that, is that, is that a skill that's going to benefit you long-term, you know, and, um, as uh, knowing how to do that, you know, is that, are you ever going to use that again? You know, if you're not ever going to eat this way and if you are going to eat that way, well, that's, you know, that's not going to be good for your health. So, but, um, you know, I think that, you know, just having fun with your daughter and having her cook things, but just, you know, impressing upon her, just saying, Hey, look, we, we can do that, but I really don't, Think it's good for us to eat this it's not it's not a good thing for us to eat it can be fun and we can do that but i don't we shouldn't eat it is that is that okay would you want to eat it afterwards and like well i kind of would want okay well then we probably should think about making something else that we would want to eat that would be good for our bodies you know maybe you can you can try it that way i don't know i mean it's it's, it's a difficult one you know because i agree i i think it's really good to to sort of foster those sorts of uh, those feelings when they want to learn something and learn a new skill. Sometimes that can be sort of molded and shifted directions. Um, but uh, yeah, just because you cook, it doesn't mean you have to eat it too. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I completely understand that because she, the, unfortunately she used to have quite a meat aversion, like 
Um, mm. When we first started a carnivore diet, it was really difficult to get her to transition. We did it though. Like she's eating, mm. I'd say 90% meat. And then we have berries yeah, every once in a while. Sometimes carbs come in, but it's so rare now. Like I, I wouldn't even like count it. So I really appreciate that. And I'm, I'm glad they used a more extreme um, example <laughs> because it, it it hits hard and you learn like you know we as humans we learn from things that hurt us and so i was like yeah you know what maybe i don't want to do that so <laughs> I, I really i really appreciate that no problem love it ellie uh rebecca you're up next from carnivore wellness that's her youtube channel if you guys want to check it out got a question for dr chafee rebecca Thank you, JT. And Dr. Chapey, thank you for being so generous with your time to be here with us and answer these questions and highlight this topic. So I'm right. a little nervous to ask my question because I think that after hearing everything, I know the answer. But in my situation, you know, I didn't know about carnivore when I was pregnant or breastfeeding or when my kids were, you know, weaning off of, you know, breast milk onto food and we're late to the game. So my kids don't eat a perfectly carnivore diet. And at this point, I am the only carnivore in the household. So without that support of my husband and, you know, being able to make sure that everything that they get is 100% carnivore, they are largely animal based still with some of those other, you know, carb sugar laden treats, uh, you know, more often than I would like. But I really am only in control a portion of the time as far as how often they get those things. So my question to you is, if my kids are animal based, which they are, and they're still eating the things like, you know, they're getting fruit, they're getting that fructose. You mentioned that that was not great. You know, mm -hmm. I, I know that's not ideal, but I have concerns and my husband's expressed concerns as well that, you know, in eating more of these animal based products, they're getting higher amounts of fat in their diet, but it's coupled with, you know, frequent doses of that sugar, even if it is in that natural fructose form. So how, you know, how concerned should I be about that high level of fat paired with that sugar? And then also I wanted to ask you about cured meats. You know, you mentioned feed the kids the things that they enjoy. Well, a lot of kids, you know, they they maybe don't always want the the pure meat. They want, you know, some of the cured meats. And so is it okay for them to include those things like salami and hot dogs and pepperoni if that's what we can get them to eat? Is it better to be animal based and eating meat heavy? or 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 not how do you navigate that when you're not able to go all in for your kids well look there's there's a certain ingredient and the closer you get to just meat you know the better and and so if, if you're not quite there that's still better than if you're you're eating less meat entirely right so you know even having a few little things added in is certainly going to be better than if you had a lot of other stuff added in so it's not one or the other it's not just like no you're vegan or you're carnivore and like nothing else you know and so it's um the more meat is better so the more meat you eat the more meat your kids eat the better those are those are the that's the where they get the nutrients that's what they need to eat right and they need the fat you know the fat is not a calorie source it is a an essential nutrient it's a compilation of essential nutrients they're essential fatty acids that you have to have or you don't develop properly you don't you're not well and you can die there are essential fat soluble nutrients that you have to have or you don't develop well and you die so you know these are these are very important and so when people say well you don't want to eat too much fat there's no such thing your body has a limited capacity to absorb fat. You make bile and that's how you absorb fat. You run out of bile, your body can't absorb fat. More than a small percentage, right? A little bit gets in, usually like MCTs. And so the rest of it goes out, you know? So physiologically, I just, I just disagree with the premise that you can overeat fat because your body will not absorb it, right? And so saying, well, you don't want to eat too much fat. If you're eating sugar, then there's too much. No, no, no. It's the sugar. The sugar is the problem. The sugar is always, well, but when you're having sugar, then fat, no, no, that sugar is the problem. Sugar is the only problem. And yes, sugar can make things worse and sugar can make your metabolism of fat worse, but it's still the sugar doing it. It is not the fat doing it. It is, it is always the sugar. The fat is still essential. The fat is still something that their, their brains and their bodies need. The sugar is not. And so, you know, if I would not give up the fat because they're having sugar, I would just try to limit the sugar and try to impress upon them that, hey, this isn't the best for us. You're already doing a great job. You know, you're already, you know, sort of steering them in the right direction. They're maybe not quite there yet, but they'll get there. You know, they are seeing you, they're seeing your results, they're seeing how well you're doing. They're feeling better and they're going to start noticing, you know, the, the more they eat meat, the more they like it. 
the more they feel good. They start eating this other crap. And they just like, oh, I don't really feel good. And you can point that out and be like, like, oh, I'm not really feeling well. I was like, well, you had that pizza yesterday. You know, that can do all these things to your body. Be like, oh, okay, damn it. You know, that pizza was good, but I don't like feeling like crap, you know? And you just, you just sort of, you know, help them understand the differences in how their body feels you know, is, is due to the different things that, that they eat. So, you know, eating, eating processed meats, depending on what's in them, you know, obviously, you know, different sausages, salamis, pepperonis, and you look at the packet and, and see the ingredients, some are just dreadful. So I just sort of avoid those and try to get ones that are, that have, have less sort of starches and oats and sugars added to them. There, there are some that have much less than that. And so you just sort of try to get those, but you know, bake, if they'll eat bacon, eat bacon, you know, and that's, that's fine. Um, it's going to be a lot better than, than eating, you know, plants or bread or something like that. So, you know, it's, I think it's, it's very beneficial to eat more meat. And obviously it's, it's also beneficial to eat less of the other things, but the more meat you eat, that's going to replace out the, the other things that they eat. So they're just going to largely be eating meat. And that's, so that's, that's better than again, 99.99% of what people are eating these days. So they're going to be a lot better better off for that they're going to develop better if they get perfect that's that's perfect but if they before they get there they're already going to be making a lot of improvements sugar is nasty i mean you know natural fruit sugar you know fructose all that stuff I mean, we call it natural that's that's a marketing ploy because if it's natural it must be good just like arsenic and cyanide right so you know it's like that's that's not necessarily a good thing uh, just because it's natural. In fact, most natural things will kill you. Plants make about a million different chemicals, most of which will kill you. They're all natural, right? None of these are pesticides that we spray on them industrially. That's what people don't realize. Before, there were all these altruistic, wonderful humanitarian people protecting all the plants by spraying them with pesticides to stop all the insects eating them. They could protect themselves. They stopped the insects and animals from eating them themselves because they made their own poisons. And so, you know, most natural things will kill you. We have a very narrow window of things that we can eat safely. And so it's, um, you know, just saying something is natural is probably not good. What's natural for us, what's natural for humans is eating meat. It's actually not natural for us to be eating all the crap that we're eating today, even broccoli, which is not natural in itself. You know, that was, that's, that's an invention, you know, a few thousand years ago, whenever the hell they made that horrible weed you know they just you know it's um it's it's it did not exist in nature pretty much none of the plants that we we eat now existed in nature they've all been hybridized or bred and gmo'd and all all the rest of this stuff so it is natural for us to eat meat and so if you want to go by what's natural that's what's natural something that exists in nature like lions maybe not you know, that's not necessarily something that's good for you. And so, but I think you're doing great, you know, just, just working them in that direction and just, you know, keeping impressing upon this, you know, you push too hard, it's too heavy handed. They're going to go, I'm not going to listen to you. So you just lead by example, you know, you lead from the front and, you know, like any good general and you just say like, Hey, look, this is what I'm doing. And you, and you just point out, Hey, this is, this is going to be better for these reasons. And you, you take them shopping with you and you say, you talk about, you know, the ingredients, well, I'm not going to do this because this has this and this, and I'm going to buy this because it's better and all that other sort of stuff. They will learn this stuff and you will be surprised 30 years later, they will be doing that to other people, you know? And, um, you know, even though, even if it, if you're, if it's a struggle now, it will make a, it will make a deep and lasting impression on your kids. Thank you for that, Dr. Chafee. I appreciate it. And I know you don't yet have kids of your own, but you have a lot of really great practical tips that I think a lot of the listeners will be able to use in their own lives and trying to guide their kids that way. So thank you for that. Yeah. Well, you're welcome. And thank you. I, I I hope it's helpful anyway. You know, it's it's hard to, you know, I see what other people do with their kids. I've seen what worked on me and what was a terrible idea. And, uh, and you know, obviously I you know, help out with my my girlfriend's kids and, and, um, and, and uh, I mean, nieces and nephews and all that sort of stuff. So, but yeah, it's, it is different. And every, every parent child relationship is different. And so it's, it's hard to give specific advice. We only speak really in generalities and what we can try to do overall, but you know, it's, uh, it's up to, you know, it, you know, it's up to the, the parents to sort of figure out what, what the best way to, to deal with their kids are. Love it. That was great. Uh, I want to give the next question to my wife here, Anna. 
Okay. Thank you, Dr. Chafee, uh, for joining and just educating us and sharing your knowledge. Um, I just really appreciate it. Um, yeah, just to go into my question a little bit, I just want to, Nia kind of did this too, and so did Rebecca. I think just as a parent, like, we are willing to do things ourselves a little bit because, you know, you're putting yourself at risk, you know, you're not putting your kid at risk, and then you're a little more hesitant to let your kid do the same thing, you know, if you're not sure what it's going to do to your kid. Um, and so I think for me, like, William eats some fruits and things right now. And JT and I actually had a deep discussion about, you know, why, why are we, why do we think that way? Why, you know, what, what's the reason behind? What are we afraid of? And I think it's really like, what, how is it going to affect him long term? So my question was, and I think this is a good question for a lot of people, you know, when, when you were doing your research and looking at studies and things, are there any negative effects that those studies listed for kids who had been on carnivore for a while? Or are there research like that, that there were longitudinal studies out there like that? No, not not in like carnivore specifically, not that I've taken like a cohort of, of kids and raised them one way and, and raised the other. A lot of the, a lot of the studies, um, so there weren't really any studies on carnivore. They weren't even calling it carnivore. So I had to sort of ask questions about, you know, being in ketosis, about different sorts of diseases, about, you know, prevalence in, you know, different time periods, about, you know, different native populations and, and their development and their development of chronic diseases and when that happened and, and how that happened about, you know, uh, you know, asking a question, okay, is autism related to diet? It, was, it came up the exact same time that I sort of looked that up. Okay, when did the numbers start coming up? It came up the exact same time, all these other chronic diseases coming up. It, could this be something to do with diet? Okay, and I started looking into that and I found like, wow, yeah, actually preconception diet where you eat mostly red meat, protects against autism. Mothers that have higher saturated fat intake during pregnancy, lower rates of kids with autism, higher LDL during pregnancy, lower rates of autism mothers who breastfeed instead of bottle feed, lower rates of autism. So, and then, then, then the Texas A&M research looking at carnitine. So there are all, all these sorts of things, but they're not carnivore specific. It's just things that add to the picture, you know, are eating is eating plants, eating sugar. That's why I was asking about sugar, you know, because formula is, has, has a lot of, uh, can have a lot of sugar in it. So I said, okay, is there a difference in autism between breastfeed and bottle feeding? There is, you know, so that suggests that there may be something to do with sugar consumption that can that can be harmful, but it's not it's not conclusive. It's certainly not carnivore versus non carnivore. Um, as far as um, you know, the I have never come across anything that showed anything about ketosis or or just eating meat or lack of vegetables as being harmful. Um, there and and there there are plenty of studies, epidemiological studies, obviously that that show that kids that are raised in vegetarian households have lower bone density, shorter stature, more developmental issues, you know, and uh, poor dentition, things like that. So certainly things that are showing harm in the other direction. And then what I think the, the most important things to look at is uh, does this hurt kids long-term or is this beneficial long-term? You look at every single native population in the world that has switched to, to uh, from a carnivore to a, an agrarian Based diet, you know, we saw this. And, you know, I talked about how there's, um, you know, there's this clear disparity in in the height and health of of populations when they switch to agriculture. We are seeing this in real time right now. We saw this last century with Native Americans, the Plains Indians in North America that were just eating bison. The study in 2001 showed that they were the tallest population of humans on Earth at that time. Now they are not. So there's a clear disparity when they stopped eating their their uh, primary diet of just meat and they, they switched over to a more Western based diet with a bunch of plants. This is long before you know the the, the bison were killed out long before the the processed food craze happened, and it's, the height and health dramatically spiked. So they're, they're actually that hurt their kids. You know, and their kids did not develop to their genetic potential. And now they're four times, they have four times the rates of chronic disease than the rest of Americans do, right? Because, you know, Europeans have had 10,000 years to get accustomed and acclimatized to some of the toxins in plants. Native Americans have not. They've had 100 years, not long enough, absolutely not long enough. So they're more susceptible 
to an in improper diet, more susceptible to the toxins in plants and more reliant on the, the nutrients in meat. And so it hits them harder. We're seeing this in the native Australian population. It's, 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 I spoke, I speak to people that work with the Aust Aboriginal uh, Australian uh, native population. And they, and they say this is actually known in the Aboriginal population that, you know, they're in the cities, they're eating city food, they're, you know, eating like crap, you know, probably drinking, doing whatever. And they get sick, they get fat, they get unwell. And they, and they know you get sick enough, you just go out into the middle of the bush and you just hang out with, you know, your family out there that's just living more naturally. And you just eating goanna and, and kangaroo and things like that. And you just spend a few months there and you get healthy again and you come back, you know, so it's, it's well known. We see that there was a, uh, the Australian, these guys were ripped. You see these pictures from the 1800s and things like that. You know, these guys are just white haired and just chiseled. Right. And, and it, it was like four generations. This guy's a great grandfather and he, and he's cut, he's like more shredded than, than I am, you know, and it's just like, he's an old man. And so, you know, and, uh, and that, that changed, that changed dramatically. Their, their height changed dramatically. There was a battle in Western Australia where I live um, in the 1800, I think in the 1840s, something like that. And, uh, there's with, you know, the British and the Aboriginals and obviously, you know, it was a bit of a slaughter because, you know, guns, uh, you know, they had, had more firepower and things like that on the British side. But a year, a couple of years later, they went back to the side of this, this battlefield and they were, they were looking around. There's just, you know, obviously skeletons everywhere. And they found that the skeletons of the Aboriginals were just giant size. They were just like, holy crap, these guys were huge. They said that the forearms of the aboriginals were longer than the outstretched arms of the British soldiers. Right. These guys are huge, just huge, right? Bullets take down huge people too. But you know, these were big, big dudes. They are not that anymore. There are some that are, that are very tall now too. That's not the norm. And so, you know, this is, this is the Maasai, you know, they're very healthy in 19, 1930. And they started introducing millet at that point. In the 1970s, they're eating a lot more corn and millet. And heart disease shows up for the first time in the Maasai population. Now they're eating a lot of corn. And they're, and Coca-Cola has delivery trucks that show up every goddamn day. And, and then they sell out within minutes. And diabetes is you know, climbing and soaring. So, no, I've never seen anything to suggest that eating this way would hurt kids. I've seen a lot of evidence to su suggest that it, it would help them in in every single way yeah i think that's really helpful you know like i think if people are hesitant you know i think that information will help them you know just to help give them reassurance that it's okay to put your kids on carnivore and maybe that'll give them the boost to do it so yeah. I think well i mean yeah no problem well you know that's the thing is to say do we have it's like well where's your longitudinal you know right randomized control trial and also yeah. first of all <laughs> It, it's Hard. sort of hard to do that with people and with the kids. Yeah. You're not going to really get ethical approval for those sorts of things. But there is there is there are just a ton of evidence that you can you can relate to this. There's physiology, there's biology, there's you know anthropology and paleoanthropology. There's there are, there are reams of data that 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 show that this is the healthiest way to go. And you know so you know evidence exists outside of a randomized controlled trial. There are no randomized controlled trials showing that parachutes work. Are you going to use one? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? Probably. You know, there's no randomized controlled trial that shows a Pythagorean theorem works. And yet we figured out that, yeah, no, that's that, that's a thing, you know. And so, you know, you, you, you have evidence that exists outside of that. The studies are great, but all studies can do is, is help guide you. And then you have to make a decision in your life and you see what happens. And if, you're, if your life goes in a very different direction than the study would suggest, then that study doesn't apply to you or may not be a good study at all. And so, you know, studies are academia, you know, studies are things that, you know, people publish these things to, you know, to, to get credentials so they can get jobs and, and things like that and get into different schools or whatever and get into drag programs or whatever. That's academia. Science is experimentation. Science is looking at the evidence. Science is looking at all bodies of evidence and saying, okay, what, what can we figure out here and using your brain and then experimenting and saying, okay, let's see what happens. And so that's what we're doing. We're taking all this evidence that, that has existed for millions of years. We're correlating it and saying, okay, well, I'm based on this evidence. I'm going to, I'm going to eat this way. And your life dramatically changes. Your health improves. Your kid's health improves. Their development improves. And all these diseases go away. You stop taking all these medications. 
And so, okay, well, there you go. That, that was a very positive experiment that you ran there. And it doesn't matter what a study says, because that is what happened in real life. You know, as, as the physicist Richard Feynman said, it doesn't matter how brilliant your theory is, and it doesn't matter how smart you are. If it doesn't agree with the experiment, it's wrong. And so that's the thing. You say, well, if you eat meat, you're going to get sick and die. And yet the exact opposite happens. Okay, it's wrong. You're wrong. So, you know, um, that's that's what you do. So there, there's plenty of evidence out there. Um, there are more and more studies coming out. You know, Courtney doing her, her PhD in this obviously is going to be at the forefront of that, which is, I think is great that that more and more people in her position are going to start actually putting out studies and research and data saying, hey, look, this is what we're finding. And, you know, it may be that this is like, oh, crap, oh, you know, maybe maybe these studies are showing things are wrong. It's not going to, you know, but it could happen. And it's important to get those studies out there. There's enough information for me to make that decision in my life. And uh, that's improved my life. And I've uh, applied this to my patients. It has improved my patients. I have yet to see a single patient who has not improved their health in very positive ways if they're able to do this. And so, you know, there there is evidence that exists outside of, of studies and all this or, you know, public randomized control trials and things like that. And you have to use that. You know, that's what that's what we use for parachutes, right? We're not gonna, we're not gonna like, you know, have that well, we'll have 50 people jump out without a parachute. I mean, it could be placebo, you know, <laughs> that just landing safely could be placebo. Well, you know, there's a thing called physics, you know, and we and we can use these physical laws and apply them in realistic life in realistic terms and real life terms to uh, situations to say, hey, this this is what we should see. And then you experiment and you say, oh look at that. Yeah. It does do that. Um, and that's what we're doing here. You know, we're, you, we're applying, you know, physical laws, chemical laws, biochemical laws, biological laws, bio, you know, botanical laws, and just facts. The fact is plants have defense chemicals. The fact is humans have been eat, eating meat for millions of years. The fact is these diseases have not shown up before the 20th century, except for Egypt, you know, when they were eating a shitload of, of wheat and beer and they had beer guts and man boobs and the Ebers papyrus showed that they knew what, what angina was they knew what heart attacks were they knew what diabetes was you know and that's because they were plagued with it because they were eating crap just like we're eating crap now and so there yeah there's just tons and tons and tons of evidence if if you're if you know where to look now dr chafee i was wondering if you could help me out here quick i mm -hmm. being on youtube and i eat carnivore with my son i get two comments and i was hoping you could just quickly address them so i could post the link to this video and shut these people up sometimes um i, I one of the comments i get is that i'm stunting my son's growth and I'm, I'm i'm making him more susceptible to a heart attack later on in life by having him on carnivore what could he what do you have to say bud Okay. Well, I mean, the, all the populations that have eaten meat or exclusively meat or near exclusively meat have always been taller than every population alive. Now there's a clear disparity before pre and post agriculture. They dropped by five inches. Brains uh, were 11% smaller for men, 17% smaller for women. Um, the and, and that was pre agriculture. There were all obviously hunter gatherers that were already gathering things and they figured out you could plant them and you wouldn't have to you know go so far to gather these things. They were on average five foot nine. Then after post agriculture on average five foot five you go back to the mammoth hunters you go back to the megafauna hunters they're on average six foot two to six foot four right and the and then the native americans the plains indians were the tallest population of humans on earth when and only when they're eating meat and only meat right and so that that is just com completely against the evidence right that, that is someone who simply does not know what the evidence says as far as heart disease is concerned more and more and more large studies, randomized controlled trials, um, meta-analyses of randomized controlled trials are all showing that there is no correlation at all between saturated fat consumption and cardiovascular disease. And in fact, the Journal of the American College of Cardiology published a massive literature review in 2020 showing that there was no association. In fact, there was an inverse association with stroke. So the more saturated fat people ate, the less strokes they were having, the less saturated fat they ate, the more strokes they were having. So this is actually protective against heart disease, as you would expect if this were a natural diet, which all the hard evidence shows that it was. Heart disease didn't exist before the 20th century. Now it's the number one killer. The first heart attack diagnosed on autopsy, proven on autopsy was in 1912. That's when we're eating the least amount of meat in 120 years until the next 10 years when we're eating even less 
And then it became more prevalent. They didn't believe the guy at first. He published this. And went, wow, this is a brand new thing. No one's ever seen anyone die from this before. And he described it. And they said, you're full of it. No one's seen that. That's not a thing. You got that wrong. 10 years later, they started going like, okay, well, maybe there's some merit to this because more people started dying from this. More people started seeing it. More people started publishing on it. 10 years after that, in the 1930s, it's the number one killer in America, right? It went down. We were eating less meat in 1920, 1930 than we were in 1912 when the first heart attack showed up. We're eating less meat. We didn't increase the meat and then heart attacks went up. We reduced meat and saturated fat and, and heart disease went up. And that was the low point in 200 years. There was a U-shaped curve from the early 1800s to now. And that was the, the bottom of the, of the point that we were eating meat. So we were eating the least amount of meat in 200 years and it spiked up to being the number one killer in America. It makes no damn sense. And there was no heart disease in the 1800s. So there is no correlation. There was no relation. There was no association between increased meat and animal fat and saturated fat intake and heart disease. In fact, there is inverse correlations or inverse relationships. And if you, you cannot, you can never show you can never show causation from associative studies. You cannot. That's just the definition of statistics. Um, there are no causative studies. There are no studies that sh can show causation. They're only correlation. They're weak at correlation, and they've been shown to be fraudulent since then. There is no correlation. As you can see, for 200 years, there is, has been no correlation between heart disease rates and meat consumption, none. And then you go back further than that. There's, I mean, you go back thousands of years, meat consumption is going up and down and up and down and up and down. Heart disease didn't exist right? And so there's no correlation. You can't prove causation from correlation, but if you show that there's no correlation, then that proves there's no causation. You have to have correlation to have causation, to have a cause and effect relationship. And there just isn't any, you know? So the, the fact that people are still clinging on to this is like, I guess it's understandable. We've been drilling this into our heads for the last 50 years, but it is strictly against the evidence. I love it. I appreciate you helping me out with that. Now I want to respect your time. Do you have, uh, do you have to go right away or do you have time for one or two more questions? If, if anybody on the panel has them. I you know, I do have a bit of time. I have to sort of leave around, around the half hour uh, just to, to get to work. But uh, yeah, I still have, have a few minutes. Yeah. Okay. Just, does anybody have one last minute question? Did you think uh, you, you want uh, Courtney? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Dr. Chafee, we've had a really great discussion about the, the current nutritional landscape, especially in westernized countries. And we're reaching this point where the research is pointing in this direction that, you know, between plant toxicology and evolutionary history, that mm, maybe we've gotten some things wrong along the way, right? Mm -hmm. So just a little bit of stats, because I want to ask you a question about perception from a, his, from a healthcare provider standpoint. Okay. So in the United States, we're looking at about 15 million kids with um, overweight or obesity, right? They're claiming that of these 15 million, there's only 300,000 diagnosed with diabetes type 1 or type 2. So it brings to mind the idea of we have all of these kids and all these families who are in situations where they're trying to hear about how to take that next step forward in preventing their health. And one of the biggest things that I always say is I don't want to raise my child to reach adulthood and have a lifetime of reversing chronic disease to have to be mm. facing, right? So for parents out there who maybe acknowledge that their kid is overweight, right? Maybe they're recognizing that the carnivore diet is the way to go and we can start being proactive now to set that child up for a successful, healthy future, right? But the statistics on and the epidemiological data is not showing that despite children meeting the diagnostic criteria for things like type 2 diabetes, how is the perception from a healthcare provider affected knowing that, hey, we have this problem, but we're not diagnosing it? right? So if I'm taking my overweight child to the provider and they are not acknowledging and they're not doing the, the statistic or not the statistical, but like the biomarker data to identify and diagnose, how can we then understand where to move forward? So as a healthcare provider, right, what do we need to do? What kind of changes do you think need to be done in order to start seeing the changes that we aspire to as a healthy nation? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, is that it, it does come down to, you know, the, the, the doctor, or the provider 
sort of advocating for their patients saying, Hey, look, we'll, we'll let's look into this and see what they're doing. Sometimes a lot, a lot of uh, medicine at the moment is, is retrospective medicine as, as opposed to prospective medicine. They're, they're looking, they're waiting for just a disaster to happen. The kids just feel horrible. They feel awful. They do this. Okay. Well, let's just check your glucose. Oh, it's 46, you know, hundred. Okay, great. All right. We'll, we'll do something about that, you know, or, or someone, I mean, I, I you know, like for, First of all, the, the reference ranges are just uh, in the lab tests. Uh, they aren't even accurate. So a doctor would say, well, it's in the reference ranges. That's fine. Um, but that's not fine because that's an average for the community. The first 2,000 people that come in for a lab test at that lab, that is the reference range. And that's why every single lab in every single city have different reference ranges everywhere in the world. And so that's not right. You know, the, the average person is is overweight. The average person is sick. 93% of Americans have at least one metabolic disease. 70% of Americans are overweight or obese. So that's who you're comparing yourself to. So you say, oh, you're right in the range. Oh, great. So I'm, I'm fat and sick. Great. Sounds good. You know, and so that's not what you want to look at. So there's different reference ranges of actual health. But however, even if they're outside of that, you know, some, some doctors will say, well, we don't, we don't even look at it until it's way out of range. You know, because, oh, it's a little off. Well, nah, we'll just keep an eye on it. Why would you just keep an eye on it? Why wouldn't you do something proactive about it? And so my, um, you know, I've, 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 talk, I've spoken to people that, you know, had issues with their thyroid. They just had, you know, weren't feeling great. They were just really low energy and they, they checked it and they're like their thyroid stimulating hormone, which goes up to, you know, their reference range is like 0.4 to 4. Better range is 0.3 to 1.5. That's the one range we use in my clinic. And so they were a bit outside of that. So like, you know, um, but not markedly elevated, but you know, had a, had a very proactive doctor. They said, okay, well, look, why is that? You know, you haven't had any thyroid issues before. Thyroid's always been fine before. Now it's a little off. Let's see why. Test them for Hashimoto's antibodies. Sure enough, had Hashimoto's disease, right? So that's catching that early. That's doing something about it, you know, before it becomes a problem. Spoke to his, his normal primary care doctor. And they said, yeah, we would normally not even look at it until the TSH was over 10. I was like, what? You know, it's just like, oh, we just don't think it's that that big a deal until you hit it, hit 10. And you, and you go like, oh, okay, well, why is this? Hashimoto's antibodies are in the thousands at that point and you have a disaster on your hands so a lot of things retrospective you know someone there's a disaster someone is just floridly sick and then you go oh okay all right let, let's try and do something about it instead of looking and saying okay what's on the horizon you know if you don't change what you're doing what's going to happen five years from now you know checking fasting insulin as opposed to just blood oh blood sugar is fine okay but, but your insulin can be elevated for 15 years before you get any elevation in your blood sugar that's pre-diabetes that's that's already a, a metabolic dysfunction and that can cause a lot of other problems having this chronically elevated uh insulin so i think it comes down to you know having having doctors rethink this not looking at things as a retrospective medicine approach but as a prospective medicine approach trying to catch things before it becomes a problem obviously you have to justify certain things to the insurance companies or they won't pay for it. A lot of the stuff I do is all private. You know, people have to pay for out of their pocket, you know, and, but they want to because they have, no one has a better, more, more of an interest in, in their own health than themselves. And so they're coming in saying, okay, you guys do things differently. You know, I'm happy to, I'm, I'm willing to pay out of pocket for these tests because I know they won't get covered, but I want to, I want to be in good health. I want to see what the hell is going on. And so sometimes, you know, doctors will just be like, well, you know, I can't really, I can't, I can't order a test or an investigation unless there's nice hats and, uh, unless there's, um, you know, a, you know, florid problem with specific things. So, you know, they might be limited, but you know, it's just, I, you know, I think it'd be massive just changing those reference ranges. Like we didn't just do the average for, for the community. If you say, if, if we sort of agreed upon like, Hey, why don't we stick to these reference ranges these are references of good health i think it would just revolutionize medicine where where doctors were, because they, they would just see they didn't know better they'd just be like wow that's out of range they're just looking for things to be in range or out of range well that's out of range holy crap you know but so many more things would be out of range you know if they if they uh if you change those reference range. for instance the optimal reference range often op optimal reference range for b12 is i've never seen a, a reference range anywhere in the in the US or Australia or Europe that actually even the top end of that even gets into what I would consider an a, an appropriate range for B12 and there's a lot of other things that apply to that too it's difficult if people are not 
testing for it, you're not going to find it. And if you're waiting for it to just be a disaster before you test for it, obviously, you know, you're going to have more problems and you're, and the, and the kids are going to be sicker. The people are going to be a lot sicker by the time you get it. Unfortunately, that's just the nature of medicine at the moment. We just, we just practice retrospective medicine. I think we need to change that to a prospective approach and try to, th you know, th think about how, how we can prevent disease, prevent problems from becoming more and more of an issue in the future. And I think that would change a lot of, a lot of things. And yeah, and we probably, yeah, we wouldn't be in the disaster we're in now anyway. Thank you so much. That was a great answer. And I also appreciate your time being here um, yeah. and sharing with the community. Thanks so much. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. I, I just have one last question before you take off. And I'm pretty sure mm -hmm. I know the answer, but I got to ask you anyways, because my buddy Carrie from Homestead Hall told me to ask you this question. And I told him I would. <laughs> Um, yeah. when you become a father, are you going to put your child on the carnivore diet? Yeah, 100. There will be no plants in my house. <laughs> it's absolutely not. So it, you know, it's easier when you start out with this because like that just will not be in their, in their universe, you know? And so by the time they're, they're getting exposed to other people, they're just going to be looking at that. Like, I don't, I don't want anything to do with that. Uh, I hope, you know, that's, that's the sort of the plan is just to sort of teach them early and young that that stuff's not food. This is what we eat. This is what we're supposed to eat. Um, I have I've had friends that have raised their kids from birth as as carnivores, and they and they have relatives that are trying to you know buy their affection with candies and cookies and all that sort of stuff. And um, and and she, and she tells them like, hey, don't give my kids this crap. I don't want them eating it. It's not good for them. Don't give it to them. You know, and uh, and you, and you get to choose that. You're like, hey, you, you're gonna you're gonna give this shit to my kids. You're not gonna get to hang out with my kids. Um, but you know, some people still do. And she actually was just sort of watching and she saw them, um, her actual mother-in-law giving her like a little cookie or, um, a little piece of cake or something like that. Kids like one and a half. The only thing she's ever eaten was meat. The only thing she ever wanted to eat was meat. She's excited. She's never had to struggle with forcing her to eat or getting her to eat every time. It's just excited, slapping the table, freaking out, you know, getting the meat. And she's like getting impatient, like, get it! you know, like yelling at her mom, to, like get the meat over to her. And, um, and, and the mother-in-law gave her like this little piece of cake and she just looked at it and went and just threw it on the floor. <laughs> she just like walked away. She, <laughs> you know, so that's what I'm going to try to do with mine, but no, there, there absolutely not be, you know, any, any crap in the house. It, it just will not, I will not accept any ingredient or anything in that house. Um, house plants aside, like that's it, you know, it just will not be anything in that, in that house when that kid's there, that will not be acceptable. <laughs> and so, you know, it's just, it's, it's nice to be able to get them from, from birth like that. It's difficult when you're, you're sort of, they're half grown and, and you have to sort of talk to them about it. And, and they're at that sort of delicate age where they don't really understand why the hell you're changing their lives so much from something that they really enjoyed. Um, but you know, when you, when you have it, a fresh start, you, you know, you can, you can really make some good headway and, and just, uh, yeah, and just just start them off as good as you can, and just teach them early on, like, hey, this is this is how we eat, and this is why, and this is this is the right thing to do. And they they were really really impressionable uh, at that age, and they'll really take it, you know. But even even um, you know up to you know, like, what was that that creepy uh, priest said that you know, give me a child till he's seven and he's mine for life, you know, that creepy bastard. It's it's true though; they're very impressionable, you know, at that at that early age. And so, you know, that that's what I will definitely be trying to do. And hopefully that sets them up for a very, very healthy and successful future. Absolutely. Well, you're a great person. You're a great leader. And I know one day you're going to make a great father, Dr. Chafee. And I appreciate okay. you coming on here and eliminating a lot of these fears that I think parents and grandparents have when they feed feeding carnivore. So I appreciate your time. And uh, this yeah. has been a blast. I really appreciate you and appreciate yeah, everybody no. on the panel and everybody watching. Yeah, no, you're welcome. It, it, it's been a pleasure. It was great to see all of you. It was, it was, it was a really fun, fun sort of forum. So thank you all for the great questions and, and for the for the time. I appreciate all your time. Absolutely. Well, you guys, that's it. Thank I'm you. Thank you. Thanks, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you guys later. Great to meet you. Let's you go. Too.